he was born almost exactly where I'm sitting right now because I I didn't have the studio set up that way then. So he was born here at home and uh, on our bed. Yeah, and, so did uh, the the home births are getting a lot more popular. Do you have like a midwife like do the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah we had no, a midwife. Cool. We were supposed to have a doula, but um, but she got she got COVID like the day before Ooh. um he was born, so she wasn't able to make it. All right, I so just then, uh, I just hit live by the way, just so you know we're. Just okay, cool. Start. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, <laughs> yeah, so warning. yeah, we we definitely loved our midwife. We loved that whole process. We loved doing it at home, especially after hearing stories from other people about the way that, like, for one thing, I, this might be a little too, TMI. I don't know, but for uh, for Amy when she was delivering, the the most uncomfortable, the most painful position possible was laying flat on her back with her legs up in the air, which is like the standard hospital delivery position. Um, that was just excruciatingly painful for her. Um, so she, uh, uh, he was ultimately delivered. She was on her, on her, like on her knees, leaning over an, over an exercise ball, um, which is a oh, much wow. more natural position. And, hmm. uh, and the midwife was like, not only did the midwife let her eat, cause at hospitals, apparently they typically won't let you eat. She was encouraging her to eat. She was like, even if you don't want to, you need to eat, like keep forcing food down. Um, and she, you know, Amy would get up and walk hmm. around and do everything and, um, so it's just a much more natural experience than the 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 hospital way, which is everything in the hospital is done for the sake of the, of the doctors and nurses, basically. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny. Uh, we went to a place for to find out the gender yesterday because um, at the hospital, it's like, you know, the insurance system is so convoluted. It's like, oh, it's a six hundred dollar bill and whatever. You have your copay, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But there's a place that actually Mike and his wife recommended to us. It's called uh, the Stork's Nest. And it's just a couple in their 60s that own it. She's been a, a ultrasound technician for like decades and you go in there and it's just the husband's work in the front desk. And it's like $80 that you can use like here. If you have a health savings account, you can use, and it's like carpeted and you go sit on a couch and then she's got like this, you know, high end machine there. But, uh, it's, it's like the, I think it's the surgery center of Oklahoma, that place that does like orthopedic surgery for like, you know, 10 cents on the dollar. Um, where it's just like, there's no bureaucracy to deal with. Like everything is cheap and straightforward with all the pricing. So it was pretty cool. Mm, that's beautiful. And they were saying that, that, uh, they're noticing like people, there's like an overlap in the Venn diagram of people who like using them and also have like the home births with like midwives and everything. So, uh, yeah, whole world yeah, I was were, unaware of. They were, yeah. they were so fun to work with. Um, cause yeah, we went there for the twins and that was to find out the genders. And that was, you know, the first one when they're like, it's a girl. And then it's like, Oh boy. <laughs> and then there was boy girl twins. So now we have a perfectly split household of two and two, but I was That's like, great. I was terrified as it'd be two little girls. Cause oh, it's a, it's a worrying <laughs> position for a father. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. I got it easy. I got a boy. Yeah. It's, 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 it's all easy. great though. I mean, it's one of those yeah. things where I was, was afraid of having a daughter and then it's like, it's the best thing ever. I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. just so awesome in their own ways. You know, it's like my son does all my boy stuff with me and then she just, turns me into a big softy and mm. has me wrapped around her finger. So we're definitely uh, hoping for a girl next. We've got the name all picked out and everything. If, if the next one's a girl. Cool. Um, so we're, 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 we're hoping for that. Cool. Well, that's a great place to start. So obviously we did a rolling start, but um, obviously if you guys been paying attention, our guest is Matt Erickson from uh, real King pilled and Twitter or in a show King pilled and co-host of wealth power and influence with Jason Stapleton. Um, and I was going to W Matt, stop being poor Erickson. <laughs> <laughs> you recently, uh, you recently gained celebrity status on Twitter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, we, we said we didn't want to talk too much about the LPMC drama. That's, that was kind of, it was entertaining for a while, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah. But I mean, I think, this is a great start to the conversation of what we wanted to talk about was kind of the overlap of like spirituality and political ideology and how those two come together. And I think your story just from listening to you over the years sounds very similar to ours, uh, especially entering fatherhood. It kind of really gives you a different perspective and you, you go way deeper into your beliefs um, once you, once you have that sort of perspective on life. So what's your experience been like since, uh, since having your son? Mm, it's been, I, for one thing, it's been an absolute whirlwind, but, uh, to, to what you're saying there, like as soon as he was, or even before he was born, as soon as we found out that he was here, it was that he was coming. Um, I felt, I felt overwhelmed. I felt like I'm, yeah, I'm not ready for this. You know, I'm, I, I was very, very happy about it. It's something we'd been working toward and planning toward and everything, but I was like, I'm not ready. You know, I'm, there's, I'm not ready and I'm not going to be ready. I'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. 
but suddenly it's like every decision that I make is imbued with so much more meaning and significance because now I'm not, you know, when it's just you and your wife, you know, you're you, you every decision you make affects two people uh, in a, in a, like directly. But once it's a child, it's just a whole new dynamic because now uh, this, this little person is, is so, how would you say it? It's like, it's like not, they're not a blank slate, but they're like a, uh, it, it, they're so uh, moldable. Every single, I think about every single little uh, like a factor influence on him is like has a dramatically disproportionate effect on the rest of his life compared to something that happens to me now. It's so like with something that happens to me, you know, if I go out and I like encounter some sort of trauma or something, I like see someone get killed or, you know, whatever, like some, some sort of traumatic thing, I'm able to contextualize that a lot more. And it's not going to affect the rest of my life in the same way that a traumatic event would affect him because he has so much, he has such a little amount of time before that event and such a long amount of time after that event that that event becomes so much more formative for him. So thinking about that effect then across everything across every aspect of our lives suddenly i feel like i'm 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 responsible for for everything that happens to this little person and if i'm not making good decisions if i'm not being um proactive and productive and uh being being true to um to what's right to being true to what's true then there's going to be this downstream effect where it's going to change. It's going to affect the rest of his life in a way that it wouldn't affect me. And, and that, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real responsibility, you know, and, and you could, you could view that as a burden uh, to some degree. And I think a lot of people do to me, it's a, it's a blessing because it's a, it's a motivator. It's a, um, it's a, it's a, what, what would you call it? Something that like, that, that like focuses and, and directs all of your energy and so it, it it kind of it's purifying really would probably be if we're going to use more like a spiritual term it's very purifying to have this experience with i mean i yeah i've had a kid for 10 months so it's not like i can speak to the whole experience of fatherhood but i can tell already that it's just a it's it's like the most transformative thing that you could go through and also something that occurred to me recently i tweeted something to this effect i don't remember what it was exactly but i said that that having a child is part of the natural natural maturation process of a human being. When you if you don't have a child, you don't ever fully grow up. Because in having a child and then when you have a child and you look at your child, you see yourself reflected back and you start understanding how your own developmental process worked. You understand how like once upon a time I was that little person. And I went through all these different types of things. And this is, and I see the way that something affects him. So now I understand how that sort of thing affected me when I was younger. So to, to like maturation is like the process of, of, um, of gaining applied wisdom might be the way that you would, you would think of it. And there, I can't think of many things that are more um, effective toward that end than, than having a child and, 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 and experiencing the process of seeing yourself reflected back in him and watching the way that, that he encounters the world, watching the way that the world encounters him and the way that changes, changes him, the way he learns, the way he adapts his tendencies, all that kind of thing. I see like, he's just a little version of me. And, uh, so I think that it's something in our society that is, has, changed recently is like the declining birth rates and people are not only are people not having children um the people who do are having them much later so this is effectively creating a, a it, it's like um uh, uh like how would you say like de-adultifying our, our our society it's 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 yeah. making we're, we're developing a society of of <clears throat> of uh of grown-up children because people aren't going through that maturation process as early as they have in traditional, you know, human history. So, uh, so all those things to together have just been, I basically never stopped thinking about it. This is always like front of mind for me. Right. Yeah. No, you were, you were pretty spiritually inclined, um, before you had a kid, right. Before your son was yeah. born. And first of all, just on the word spirituality, I, I hate using the term because I feel like people cop out of using words like God and religion because they don't want to be like cornered into a belief system, but it's just such a cop out. It's like when people say like, 
uh, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. It's like, it's like, okay, you don't have any discipline that you claim. It's like, if you ask somebody like, like, oh, I'm a fighter. It's like, oh, what's your, what's your discipline? Like what background do you come from? It's like, oh, bro, I'm just a, I'm a fucking street fighter freestyle. It's like, okay, you're full of shit. Like you're, you don't actually have anything. It's the same thing with religion where it's like, okay, I acknowledge, even if you're not practicing, like I come from Catholicism and I, you know, that's really what molded my worldview. So you grew up religious, right? Yeah, very much so. I was, uh, I was raised, uh, I was raised a very conservative Protestant, which I'm, I'm realizing now that there's a bit of a conflict in terms there. Um, but, uh, I was raised a, a uh, I was a Protestant. Seventh-day Adventist was the the denomination that I I really grew up in, and it's a very legalistic um, sect of Protestantism, and it's very, it, it's funny because you know so so Seventh Day is 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 a reference to the Sabbath, and and uh, a key defining feature of Adventism is the belief that Saturday is the Sabbath and is the day that is to be worshiped. And then there's all these prescriptions for how to, how to, how to, um, uh, how to treat the Sabbath, how to, how to, uh, revere, how to worship all of that. And, and then, and then Advent is, is a reference to Jesus Advent, Jesus second coming. So it's a very eschatological denomination, but in spite of, so those are both very kind of abstract concepts, but it turns out that the, the denomination winds up being very materialistic and so that was kind of the 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 background that I had, and and growing up, I mean, I went to I went to like a, I went to a church uh, academy. I went to a, a, a church. I mean, the, the academy was like no mixed swimming, no like you weren't allowed to have headphones um, because you had to have all of your music approved by the dean when you first got there. And if music had drums or something in it, then you weren't allowed to have it. Like that's the kind of place that I went. And then um, I went to an evangelism school afterwards. Um, like le- I, I had a period of time where I was going door to door, like knocking on doors and, and, and scheduling Bible studies with people and giving Bible studies, going to evangelistic series. Like I, that's, that was my late teens. And then I went to a college that was also a church college in Eastern Washington. And it was there that I kind of started drifting away from the church. It just didn't have a lot of, of, of meaning to me in my, my day to day life. It was, the, the culture was kind of the what what was what has stuck with me is that culture of of being part of a community where everybody thinks and feels the same way and sees the world the same way where you have that kind of natural camaraderie and you don't re- you don't realize that it's there until you go away from it and so as I drifted away from the church throughout my twenties I got into you know, uh, into, into politics and into sports and be a big fantasy football player. I was, always have been. And, uh, that kind of is what, what began to dominate my, my thinking and my worldview. And it was, it was digging into politics and understanding. It's like, I, I keep going back further and further because I, it's like, I, okay, I want to understand this event. So I need to go study everything that led up to it to understand that event. Well, then I encounter a new bunch of events. And to understand those, I need to go study everything that led up to them. And I keep doing this and going further and further and further back. And then I, I realized that that politics and religion are effectively the same, that they're the same thing. It's the same, uh, it's the same software in you know, your, your, your cognitive operating system, just expressing itself in different ways. And every, every state will have a religion. And every religion will inevitably function in some sense as a state within its within its sphere, because the 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 derivation or the development of a, of a of a government of a governing body is part of this pursuit of some of of like the the highest metaphysical end. It's the highest moral value that the that the society gathers itself around, and that's inevitably going to be a religious experience. Um, so I, as I've, as I've kind of circled back around the way I've described it before is it was kind of like, I grew up, it's like, I grew up at the foot of a mountain and I was looking at this large mountain and it was a, it was this mountain of the church of, of religion, broadly speaking. And I kind of got tired of looking at it. I sort of tried to climb it a few times and then just kind of got tired of looking at it. And, uh, I turned and just kind of walked away from it. And it's like, I went out and I did this kind of, kind of journey out through the woods and I circled back around and I came up on, I, I, you know, as I was going through, I came up on another mountain and I'm looking at this mountain and I'm very interested in it and I'm trying to climb it. It's this mountain of politics. 
And as I'm climbing this mountain, eventually I realize it's the exact same mountain that I was looking at before. I'm just coming at it from a different side. And so you, you mentioned this, uh, this religion versus spirituality thing. And I think that the, that is like, I understand the sentiment where that comes from when people say that, because they're like, I don't want to be affiliated with organized religion. And there's this, this dynamic that has happened where, uh, the, the nature of religion that we have today, where you've got all these different religions intermingling and, and even within Christianity, there's a trillion different denominations and, uh, everyone has their own. And, 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 and religion is like sort of a sideshow in everyone's lives. Even people who are extremely devout, it's often not the thing that dominates their whole life. And that's a, that's a, that's a relatively recent development that human history hasn't related to religions in that sense. If you go back to uh, like, say you read an encyclopedia about Greece or Rome, you'll see it'll be broken down. I mean, you might have like, you know, the geography and then you might have the economy and you'll have the culture and then you'll have the religion. It'll be just kind of one of a, it's like a subset of the, of the, of the great whole. If you took someone from ancient Greece or Rome and brought them today to um, and, and and showed them that encyclopedia and they looked at it, they wouldn't understand that like conceptualization of religion, religion as being a subset of the rest of your life. That's actually a, a product of part of the evolution of Christianity. The, the, the concept of the secular and then the religious being two separate distinct things. That was something that developed, I think it was around a thousand years ago within the Christian church. Uh, so to, to the ancient Greeks or Romans or any other ancient culture, th their religion was just their view of reality. It was just the way that they understood the world. Everything was built upon that. It wasn't a, it wasn't a subset of their life. It was their life. Everything that they did revolved around that. And that's where the word religion actually comes from. It's the word religio, which means, which is a reference to like to bind. It's the thing that binds everyone together. And so when, when you understand it from that, that kind of conceptualization, you realize that, that, that religion is inevitable, that everyone has a religion. Religion is a fundamental constituent of the human psyche. The question is, what religion? What, what is your religion? What is your God? What is, your, what is the highest value that drives all of your decision making? What is, the, what is the thing that you have your eyes fixed on in whatever direction when you make decisions? That's your religion. And there's a there's a dynamic where um, you know you, you you have a word and you have the the meaning of the word and those are two separate things and so we'll use a word to try to convey this the the meaning and every once in a while you'll get this thing where where the word's usage begins to be associated with a different meaning and you lose the original meaning a great example of this is inflation so with inflation people say that inflation is the is like the general rise in prices across the economy, or it could be localized as well. But uh, it's it's it, inflation to people now today just means like a rise in prices. But inflation is a consequence of, for example, the expansion of the money supply. So you get the expansion of the money supply um, and or the increased velocity of money, and that causes a rise in prices. But because inflation has come to mean a rise in prices, people have lost. What causes that? There's no longer a word to describe uh, an, in, or an expansion in the money supply. And you have to say an expansion in the money supply, and then you have to kind of explain all that. I think a similar thing has happened with religion, where now religion has come to mean to people this organized um, uh, kind of bureaucratic subset of life that people on the weekend, you go to this church and it's, you know, religion is, is, is very, it's got a very constrained definition. And so people... Are, are now are like, well, I don't have a religion, you know? And so they, 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 when they say, when they want to be like, maybe they have the sentiment where they like, oh yeah, I, you know, I, I actually do feel like I have a religion, but I don't want people to think I'm associated with that kind of thing. So they say, well, I'm just, I'm spiritual. Um, but like you said, that doesn't capture the, that doesn't capture the essence of it. And there's, there's a degree to which people aren't being honest because, you know, they say, well, I'm spiritual. Um, but like I said, they're still religious. They still have a religion and that religion motivates them. It drives the way that they behave. And so I think that, um, people who try to put religion into a box, um, because of this sort of distorted perspective of what religion is, they, they end up kind of like deceiving themselves 
because they 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 convince themselves that they were well, I'm I'm not religious, you know, I'm just spiritual. I'm not religious. And that sentiment in and of itself can be a religion. You know, you're you're, you're going to get a group of people that all bind together and they 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 um unite their society around the idea that we're not religious, we're spiritual. Well, now okay. So now your religion is that you're spiritual. Um so there's there's the kind of there's like a turtles all the way down sort of thing going on there. But um anyways, to kind of wrap up this wrap up this little little rant here. It it is a uh I think we're moving into an era where people are realizing they're recognizing uh, a, a void in their life. They're realizing that having constrained, like you can't take religion and just, and just cram it into a box and leave it there and only open it every once in a while. It's going to keep coming around. To, it's going to keep coming around to get you. It's, it's, it's always going to get itself out of the box. So uh, I think people are kind of coming to grips with that. And we're starting to enter a new age. Like, like Vin Armani has called it the dim age. Um, and and he's talked about the material versus the mystical era, and we're moving into an era where I think we're going to start seeing a big revival in religious sentiment, and that's in 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 a good sense and a bad sense. It's going to go both directions, uh, and and so I, you know this has been kind of my experience, like through having a son, like this has really kind of reopened my eyes to this sort of thing and reinvigorated my desire to to be very conscious about what my religious practice is going to be what my religious beliefs are and 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 how I'm going to orient myself religiously because whatever I choose is going to have a dramatic effect on him yeah yeah so Matt you were actually the first episode of this podcast about 60 episodes ago and we uh that's right we had a conversation about we we called it the degradation of American culture and it, it kind of I wanted to expand upon a little bit about, about that whole concept um so how much of like the social and, and cultural kind of uh, evolution we've gone through over the last 50, 60 years, do you think has uh, affected people's like uh, openness to being religion uh, or religious in their life? Because a lot, there's so many people that are more atheists and kind of got away from organized religion. Um, I know Nick mentioned we went to Catholic school until fifth grade. Then we went to public school. And I remember like right away, like, you know, everyone's watching Family Guy, which just mocked religion relentlessly every night. So, and, you know, John Stewart and all that kind of stuff. So it was like, you know, kind of like stayed in the closet, like, oh, I don't want these, these people know that I just came from this, like, you know, organized religion school to these people who just mock it relentlessly because you, you think you'd be an outcast there. And not until I was an adult, I realized that probably had some sort of like subconscious impact on like, if I really wanted to go, go deep and become religious or not. And I kind of went through the same thing as you, my late teens, early twenties, just kind of fell away. Um, never became an atheist, but uh, just kind of was like, you know, I, I believe there's something, some kind of higher power, but I, I don't know this, that, you know, there's too many incon uh, inconsistencies with the Catholic church and a lot of things I just did not agree with. And then um, kind of like what you said, once, uh, once I was about 25 and had my stepdaughter and then my son really quick, it kind of flipped. And I was like, Oh wait, I'm glad I never threw the baby out with the bathwater because there is <laughs> this is a super valuable thing to people's lives. Um, but kind of back to my question, like, what do you think the the social pressure to to get away from religion, given separation in church and state and all the uh, music, television type influences on people? I think that that is probably one of the major dynamics that drove this this phenomenon. I'm I'm kind of trying to describe here where people have taken religion and, 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 and tried to constrain it within a box of, and, and they've taken, they've almost, they've almost redefined religion to be, um, I don't know how you would say it concisely. It's like religion is like a, a like a, a sociocultural practice um, associated with a standing institution and uh, something that's like deeply personal and doesn't necessarily have a universal relevance or something like that. And and it, and it's treated as something that you can kind of take or or you can kind of give or take. Like it's like you know whatever. I think a lot of that effect has been um, from the cause of, like you said, it, it being treated as like this rise of 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 um, of secularism and modernity, and uh, really, I, I don't. I could go on forever about this. But if you go get me down this one rabbit hole. Basically, as I've kind of tried to trace history and, and and try to get a get a grasp on the political sphere and the evolution of political thought throughout the last two thousand years or so, I've realized that the political sphere has has paralleled the 
the religious sphere. They both operate in parallel, which is part of what revealed to me that is you're, you're dealing with the same thing here. But you you see, uh, there's been a big decentralization of um, organized religion. We'll speak with specific. We'll speak specifically within the context of Christianity, just because that's the um, in in the West. Effectively, we're all Christians now, uh, in the sense that like in Rome, you would have described most Romans as pagan. Um, because they, you know, the majority of them descended from pagan culture. That's the, the, the in the same sense, we're Christians. Um, we're all Christians. The, 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 the basis of our worldview is derived from the Bible. Um, I think it was, it was like Camille Paglia, who's, who's a, an, an atheist, but she said that she thinks people should study the Bible because you can't understand the, you can't understand Western civilization without the Bible. Um, because it's, it's all of it's derived from that. So, so within Christianity, um, you you know you had the 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 one holy Catholic Apostolic Church um, throughout the the first you know five hundred to a thousand years of um, post post Christ, and then you had the first major split. You had the split between the East and the West, and uh, the 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 West became the, like the Roman Catholic Church. It was the Latin side, and from there then you had the reformation that began that started carving off away from from the roman catholic church and then you got these within within the context of christianity you had these three broad um sectors where you had eastern orthodoxy then you had the roman catholic church and then you had all of protestantism and then protestantism um because america was founded by protestants and because of the political effects of America, Protestantism has become um, it, it, Protestantism has leaked into basically everything. You've got Protestantism now um, affecting uh, the Roman Catholic Church. It's it's like leaking back into it. And the Protestant Reformation was a decentralization of authority and uh, and and focus within the Christian world. With each like successive aspect of the Reformation, you had a greater and greater decentralization to the point that um, you reached once you got to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a continuation of this decentralizing aspect of the Reformation, and I think that it reached its like it's like apotheosis with with Descartes when he said, "I think, therefore I am." He reduced you went from you, the Church and everyone as a part of the body of of Christ to I think, therefore, I am. It reduced it down to the individual. And since Descartes, the way that I'm starting to understand Western civilization is that it has basically been rebuilding the church, except it's been rebuilding it around a new God. And that God is man. It's, the, it's like the capital S self. It's the idealized self or the idealized individual. And it's using the same... Um, the same moral superstructure. It's, it's it's basically wanting to recreate the Christian church, but it's but it's it's creating it. It's creating God in the image of man instead of man in the image of God. Gotcha. And yeah, we, let's say we have uh, Andrew from Popular Liberty in the chat. He says uh, they're trying to repress religion like it's an unhealthy emotion, and now it's manifesting itself into a much more unhealthy way. Right. 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 Because you can't. You you can't uh, you can't eliminate like the, the the urge to eliminate religion is itself a religious impulse right yes and so when you try to eliminate it all you're doing is you're spreading a new religion and and there's a I think that when when you once you realize that you kind of start really really kind of like pondering or, or meditating on that thought I, I, I within that it's like all of, all of reality is contained within that idea that um, that that religion is inevitable. That 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 man is a religious being that operates religiously, and and it it, it the, the question is who is your god or what is your god? What is it going to be? Because you're going to be religious about something. What is that? And so I think um, what we're seeing is um, is kind of inevitable. I mean, it, there's this this we like to think of of things kind of in this like ideal or abstract way where we're um, like I've said to be provocative. I've said the Enlightenment was a mistake. And um, I've said that just because it kind of makes people go, what? Um, and, and, I, and I say that because I think that the, the, the spirit of the Enlightenment was on net uh, like a negative thing. At the same time, it was also inevitable. Like, it's like we don't have multiple simulations of reality. We have one. 
and it's happened. You know, everything that has happened was supposed to happen because it did happen. Uh, and, and you can't go back and change it. You can just deal with what has already happened. And we, we don't, I think this is kind of a Western thing. Like we don't deal with reality in that way. We, we, we idealize everything and we kind of abstract ourselves away from the real world. And this is, this is especially prominent within libertarian circles where libertarians don't want to deal with the world as it exists in front of them. They want to imagine a hypothetical ideal world and they want to pretend that they not pretend that's kind of a harsh word, but they, they act as if they live in this hypothetical ideal world that operates according to their ideal principles. And they, and that world doesn't exist. Picanones has been saying that, you know, in Kapistan exists in your head, you know, you yeah. got to get out of your head and get into the real world. So, um, it was inevitable that we would get to this point that there would be this this expansion of 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 like of secular atheism. But now, what we're seeing is the consequences of that. We're 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 watching today a civil war within Christianity, and 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 it, and this is just the latest one. There's there's been successive civil wars within Christianity throughout the last two thousand years. Each new generation tries to reform the prior one. If you listen to the 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 Church of Woke. If you listen to the way that they talk, they talk like Christians. Their their emphasis is a is a distinctly Christian emphasis. This um desire to um to uplift the poor and downtrodden and oppressed. And the the emphasis on the individual, the value of the individual, these are things that didn't exist in human history prior to Christianity. They were introduced by Christianity. This is why I say we're all Christians today. Culturally speaking, we're all Christians. And what you're seeing today is the the Church of Woke, which is a a a secular. It's a it's like a an atheist. Um, it's like an atheist denomination of Protestantism. In, in essence, it's kind of like an emergent atheist denomination of Protestantism. Their attacks on the prior generation are, in essence, saying you guys are bad Christians. Look at look at how much you've let your society go to waste. Look at how. Um, you you guys have not been true to the Christian calling to look out for the poor and the widows and their infirmity. You're not, you aren't taking care of the world around you. We are going to come in and do that, but they're operating from a sphere where they're taking the, the, the it's like a direct inversion of the actual Christian hierarchy where they're, instead of acting as man made in the image of God, they're acting as if they are God made in the image of man. You know, I, and what's uh, what's frustrating, or tell me what you think of this point. I've I've thought about this, where the sort of um, the the atheistic sort of worldview, where you're still trying to be benevolent, it's like they have this knee jerk reaction to reject tradition. And to me, if you're ignorant of tradition, then you're ignorant of history because they're intertwined completely. I mean, history is tradition, tradition is history. And when you see this rejection of Christianity, even though it's the culture that molded you, um, you have to replace it with something. And to me, it's like, I think we all innately have this suspicion, this gut feeling or intuition that there is a higher purpose. Like people that are uh, atheists will say like, oh, well, you know, I just think the universe wants this. And it's like, okay, you're just replacing the word God with universe. Like there's right. nothing, there's yeah. nothing brave about that. And, you know, it's like this, this unwillingness to, to embrace tradition has led us in this point where we're starting from scratch and we're not looking at all of the folly and history repeating itself. And the other thing, I think that that sort of intuition that we all have, it's like, if you ask somebody like, why do you believe in God? It, it, to me, it's like, just the fact that anything at all exists and the fact that not only does stuff exist, but I'm conscious and experiencing it. That's all the proof I need. I don't need God to put a lightning bolt, you know, on my front doorstep or something like, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at and how I've been thinking about like this whole, uh, woke the church of woke movement. Yeah. I like, I really like how you, you emphasize tradition there because that's, that's kind of what I've, I've been coming back around to is I've, I've, I've realized and understood the reason for tradition and ritual and that, that tradition is the way that human beings embody knowledge and pass it on to future generations. And, and, and it's inevitable as well. Trying to reject tradition is, is, um, is, is insanity. It's, it's complete folly because we everything that we do is it is the is an embodiment of a tradition 
And and even this, like the, the desire to reject tradition is itself a desire to create a new tradition. So then it's not that they're wanting to reject tradition. It's that they just don't like that tradition and they want to have a different tradition. But everything that you do is is embodied in some kind of a tradition, some kind of a ritual. The From the way that you you get up in the morning to the way that you make your food, the way that you, um, the way that you communicate to your spouse or your child. These are all ritualized practices that have been uh, handed down. Like you're just embodying the behavior that you you saw in adults when you were growing up. Now you're kind of adapting it and you're tweaking it and you're changing it, but you're not behaving in a completely diametrically different, like, like you're using the language. A language is a tradition. You're, you're, you're in speaking English as a, as a, as an American with American parents, you're participating in the tradition of speaking English because that's a way that you have that, uh, a, a, a network of symbols that we've derived to, to be able to understand the world around us and communicate with each other within it. So the, we, we can't understand the world outside of tradition and ritual and and it's just the same as is I mean I, and I would just say that's what religion is. Religion is the is the traditions and rituals that you that you practice regularly. You and you don't you don't get away from that. Attempting to eliminate them is just replacing them. Attempting to eliminate ritual or tradition is just replacing it with a new ritual or tradition. For sure. And G.K. Chesterton said, um, his, one of my favorite quotes of all time. G.K. Chesterton said uh, something to the effect of, bef "Before you tear down a fence, stop and think for a little bit about why it was built because it was put there for a reason." This is part of what drives social cycles is uh, generations, as, as you go from one generation to the next, the, the earlier generation passes down rituals and traditions with them that, that embody knowledge to the next generation. And then the next generation will embody those same rituals and traditions because their parents did. And then their children will do the same thing. But as soon as you start getting to like the great grandchild or great great grandchild, those people never knew the their 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 um great great grandparents or great great grandparents. Um, in most cases, um, and even if they did know them, they couldn't really relate to them because the they was they 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 grew up in such different worlds. So eventually, a generation after four generations or so the present generation begins to to not care about the the traditions or rituals of their ancestors anymore and they begin to move away from them and what they'll find after a period of time is that those rituals were load bearing there was a reason that their ancestors participated in those rituals because that was what they had derived to solve problems and as soon as you stop participating in that ritual that problem reemerges and this is this, so this is where you get the idea of like those who um, forget history are doomed to repeat it and and this is what drives like the rise and fall of 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 human social cycles is is people falling away from earlier traditions. There's other dynamics that are that are at play as well, but that's this is a large one. Humans fall away from their earlier rituals and traditions. It's like oh, I don't need to do it anymore. That was something my parents did, but there's no reason for me to do it now. And once you stop doing it, event that you know it's like you get hit by a freight train from out of nowhere when you you realize oh they were doing that for a reason and now that i'm not doing it i have this new these new problems on my hands so now i'm going to have to create a new set of 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 rituals to to manage this problem in front of me and uh and and then eventually i'll 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 like uh um i'll, 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 I'll like trap those rituals in time and I'll begin um, repeating them over and over again. I'll pass them on to my children, my children to pass them on to their children. And you repeat the cycle all over again. So um, not to make this the Vin Armani show, but another point that he's made out uh, that he's made recently is that um, today, the majority of our, the way our world functions is indistinguishable from magic. Most people have no idea how, the world around them works. Like we're sitting here right now, I'm talking into a microphone that's connected in to a little box that goes into my computer. My computer's connected to you guys. I'm looking at you on a screen. There's a camera in front of me. I don't understand how any of these things work. I just know that they work and I know which, I know which rituals to participate in to make them do what I want them to do. If those rituals stop working for some reason, I have to go call an expert. I have to go call like a, a, a magician to come fix this problem. It's, it's, it's completely, it's, it's functionally indistinguishable from magic for us. And this is, I, I, there's a, um, 
as, as, as our culture is becoming more and more complex with technologies like this, we're getting to the point where the people who actually understood life without these mat pieces of magic are, are no longer with us. They're no longer around. I saw a thing recently that was um, with the, I think it was related to that pipeline uh, issue of, of, of uh, a few months back where one of the, one of the people said that, uh, that these things have been working. These pipelines have been working just like basically flawlessly for so for decades now to the point where we no longer have anybody working for us who actually understands how they work. Those generations yeah. have died off. The new generations don't understand how they work. This is like we're steaming toward a, a cliff where eventually we're going to have everybody who's we, we, we've we've destroyed all of our our rituals and traditions of our ancestors. The, the 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 hockey stick of technology is just taking off so fast that each new generation is living in a, in a completely different world than the prior one. And we're getting to the point where we don't even know how to how to interact with the world around us. Like we 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 know the the specific ritualist ritualized steps that we have to take, but outside of that, as soon as something goes off the rails, we're not equipped to to deal with it. And I think that there's there's natural cycles that be that are baked into this that eventually, I mean, if you read the Bible, you get things like the Tower of Babel and Noah's flood and and these concepts that are uh, that that point to this reality, I think that humans are are uh, are are doomed or or it's inevitable that humans will uh, cast aside the traditions and rituals of their ancestors because they'll say, well, I'm smart. I'm smarter than my ancestors were. You know, I'm look how look how far we've progressed. Look how intelligent we are now. Look how much we know. Look how much we've discovered. We don't need those silly old traditions anymore. And you lose them, and eventually you're going to pay the price for losing them. And, and, and it'll reduce you back to that point again, and then you'll start the process all over again. Yeah. Do you think that's why we see this sort of uh, longing for people to kind of like live off the land and be able to make a fire with two sticks and all these things? Because it's like, you know, as we get into this, uh, you know, technocracy and this very technological world, um, we're losing touch with that past. And I mean, this is what, uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber talked about, like we are becoming <laughs> slaves to our technology. I always find a way to work in the Unabomber. We're, we're already on all the lists, so it's not a big deal, but <laughs> that's um, good. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think, do you think that's why we see this sort of like people dream of like living, living in a, a log cabin, like away from civilization, because it's like, no matter what, it's just like, those are the roots of humanity and civilization. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a, uh, there's kind of like a deep evolutionary sentiment there where we, we're beginning to sense the instability of our time and, uh, and our, I mean, ultimately we are, we are products of nature. We are not, we're, we're animals. We're, we're, we're created animals with, um, with a with with a consciousness that the rest of creation doesn't have, but we still have that animal nature to us as well. And when we divorce ourselves too far from nature, our, our health begins to, to 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 pay the price. You begin you can you can tell. We get softer, we get more diseased, we you know, and uh, you know our our health declines. And um, there's you you I. There's a there's there's cycles that you see throughout history of of catastrophe and um uh, you know if, if if anybody's familiar with Graham Hancock Randall Carlson like you'll 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 understand the the idea of like catastrophism and and uh you know that there's these cycles every six thousand twelve thousand twenty four thousand every every so often there's these cy- these 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 catastrophic cycles that um that that radically transform the the nature of the planet and it almost wipes mm-hmm. humans out every time it ha- every time it happens and um i've been uh, popular liberty speaking of popular liberty he he introduced me to a channel recently on youtube that talks about uh the 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 geomagnetic situation between the earth and the sun and it points to the the probability that there's going to be some one of these cycles that happens again at some point in the next few generations and I wouldn't be surprised if our bodies, if, if somehow, you know, you know, we're, we're electrical beings. Like we're, we, we have an electrical charge in us. I mean, I don't, I don't understand electricity. I, this stuff's all over my head. I just kind of understand the, uh, like, I, I understand what the smart people tell me. And uh, the, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we can sense that coming 
in um in in the in the air kind of like there's a, there's an energy field that we're that we're connected to that there's like a tension that's building and we can sense that and uh graham hancock made this really interesting point in one of his books that if you imagine right now just imagine out of nowhere all of a sudden we get an alert that in 12 hours uh a comet the size of new york city is going to hit the planet it's going to cause it's going to like like flood half the half the planet and um cause the 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 temperature to spike and then drop by 15 degrees and um there's going to be a, a 500 foot rise in sea levels and a nuclear winter is going to descend for a thousand years like that kind of thing the human beings who would survive that it's not going to be us it, 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 you could multiple orders of magnitude smaller than that of a crisis would take us out because of how dependent we are on the electrical grid, on our grocery stores, on our cars, all of these things that would no longer be of any use. The people who are going to survive something like that are going to be hunter gatherers because mm -hmm. they're already living at that subsistence level. They know how to live off the land and it's not going to change their lifestyle that much. We're the ones whose lifestyle is going to be changed dramatically. And so I think that there's there's a there's a sense in the air. I think that 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 we can, uh, you, you know, we we we're, we're connected to the energy field in some way, and we we can sense that something is going to happen. And there's part of us, something deep and biological in us, that says this is the path forward. This is what will preserve you if you're going to be preserved. And 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 so people, and I mean, then there's a conscious awareness of this as well. People have studied all of this, and and they you know it drives the preppers and all of that kind of thing. Uh, so, so that dynamic is there as well, but I'm, 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 I'm confident that there's a, uh, a, like a spiritual sense that we have that tells us we need to be prepared for something like that. Yeah. Now, what yeah. If, I, I was thinking about like, um, when you're talking about the hockey stick of technology and just looking at the in the nineties when I was a kid, like my dad having a pager and like how that thing's just like, it's like the butt of a joke now. It's, it's so ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. but by the time my kids are my age, us doing the stream yard thing that you just called magic might be just as silly to them. Like right. what, what happens when they just throw on VR goggles that are indistinguishable from real life. And instead of Twitter being a group chat, you're really talking to people and you're sitting down in your living room, having a beer, thinking you're at a bar with me and you right now talking and we can't tell we're not actually there. And what if like the workplace turns into that where that's, you go to work, just put on your goggles, never leave your house. Like, and, and all those kinds of things, like what kind of soft people is made, like for their environment to actually ever survive because it's going to be so like just networked through technology um i thought about that quite a bit and even like just like the nefarious side of that where how people could like cheat on their spouse and not tell it wasn't real just through a, a situation like that hmm. like because it's like just internet you know it's like just messaging someone on facebook or something but it's vr like you would not be able to know it's not real so it, it's like i'm not trying to be like terrified of like what's to come with technology because a lot of great things come but it's like there, there is going to be a dark side to all this and yeah and brave new world yeah and that's where like the like living in the cabin off the grid gets way more attractive when you start thinking about that progression and that's why i respect like the amish and the mennonites is they kind of saw where it was going and they're like ah, we're gonna stop right here this is good right <laughs> i mean and, and they still take some of it they're like yeah we'll still take cars but you know we'll do this and um it's it, that's becoming more and more attractive to me as i'm starting to get a family and see where things are going. And I think and, uh, a big part, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, before we get away from that topic, when you were talking about that sense that people feel instability and something changing, I remember it's probably like four or five years ago when I was going through my like hardcore weed phase. Um, I was under the influence of an edible and I was watching uh, Lord of the Rings, the fellowship, the first one for, you know, the thousandth time in my life. And the opening line is Galadriel. She's saying like, the world is changing. I can feel it in the air or I can smell it in the air. Mm. I feel it in the earth. And I remember just being like, damn, I feel that. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it was this, and I think that like, that was, a, uh, you know, Tolkien, like, you know, yeah. saying that, I mean, the guy was a very deep thinker, you know, world war one vet. And, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, just I, I just wanted to make that note that I, I do agree. I think people feel like there's a, a sense that we don't quite understand that that we're in a time that's like it's like a, a nexus event. That's a that's a really good point, because we're we've back to the religion, spirituality thing. We are uh, we are spiritual beings with physical bodies and we have gotten we're, we're going 
we're coming out of a material age right now. There's this cycle back and forth throughout history between material and mystical that drives a lot of other social cycles. And we're moving into a mystical age. Like this whole, the, the church of woke thing is all, these are all, they're making mystical claims like this, this, this idea about like gender, the gender is like this thing that it, it, it's, it's kind of like undefinable and you just, you're born with it. And, um, and then it like it, it expresses itself and, and it's not, you can't touch it. You can't see it, but it's just like, it's very individualized and all the, mm -hmm. everything about this is all very, very mystical. And, and I think it's starting to revive this big part of the effects of technology is that technology has trapped us much more in the material world. And, uh, and we're just part and part of that natural cycle of, of, of materialism to mysticalism and, and back and forth. But we're, we're, as we reenter this mystical age, our mystical sense is kind of being revived and we're starting to, um, you know, humans are there. There's a, people are, people have, have been studying consciousness for a while now and trying to understand it. And one way that, that people understand it, that's pretty compelling to me is that, uh, that consciousness is like a field that, and our bodies are receivers for it. Mm -hmm. So consciousness isn't something that's produced by us. It's something that, that our, our, um, kind of like a, like a radio antenna. Um, I think that was the, maybe like the Aldous Huxley uh, understanding of it. I don't remember. Um, but, but so we were like receivers of consciousness and consciousness is this field that we all, we all participate in. And so there's kind of like a Borg effect here where a, a change to the field affects the rest of us. And, and we start kind of sensing it. Maybe that's where probably where you get the force and that kind of thing as well. Um, but, uh, to the to the conversation about technology, I think that the uh, Mike you mentioned the the dark side of technology and uh, and there's there's always I think there's always a dark and a light side to it and it's a matter of like keeping them balanced and what's happening is that the dark side is beginning to win and I think the the dark side inevitably will overtake the light side and it will cause a, a rebounding effect and my like hypothesis about that would be that it's as as technology increases you get this you get this this rapid this exponential expansion or this exponential growth in the development of technologies where the 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 technological world of somebody in 1850 and somebody in 1900 wasn't that different mm -hmm. 1900 to 1950 was a dramatic difference 1950 to 2000 was an a, a, an astonishing difference and 2000 to 2050 is going to be just like incomprehensibly different that exponential effect there means that each gener each successive generation is literally growing up in a new world, a completely different world. Mm -hmm. And you get a breakdown in this, in this, this uh, handing down of ritual and tradition from one generation to the next, because it's like, you're, you know, my parents' rituals don't have any, you know, my, my, my you know, like you said, my dad had a pager. I've got a smartphone. My child is going to have some sort of like a brain implant, you know? And so, you know, the, just on a really like rudimentary level, my dad gets up in the morning, he's walking, he's heading out to work. He stops and he grabs his pager and he clips it onto his belt and he goes out and gets in the car and drives away. I get up in the morning, my phone is next to my bed, where it shouldn't be, honestly, but my phone's next to my bed and I pick it up and I have it and I carry it around with me throughout the day. Maybe my my child gets up and it just boom, it automatically switches on. Well, that that effect of of, of reaching out and picking up the physical device and carrying it around. That's a ritual that my child no longer participates in. So that's like a very, very rudimentary level, um, uh, uh, change, but that sort of change cascades all the way down throughout the rest of where you could think of all the way up throughout the rest of, of like human experience going from one generation to the next. And I think that that's what, that's what ultimately causes the kind of like the collapse of the downfall, the inevitable cyclical downfall is that, uh, one like generations become just completely detached from each other. They lose their contextualization for the world that they live in. And it's like each generation is rediscovering the world anew. And, uh, and you can only do that for so long before something's going to give, and there's going to be some kind of major crisis. And, and, you know, now that we live now that our lives are so dependent upon something as, as potentially fragile and unstable as an electrical grid, you know, it's just a matter of time before something happens. We get some major, um, uh, uh, like solar blast from the sun, or we get some, uh, uh, terrorist attack or, uh, some, I don't know, 
massive, like the largest volcanic eruption of all time, or, you know, some sort of something like that, that causes a massive change, completely disrupts the electrical grid. Even if it went down for six months, the, the world would be completely transformed. It would be absolutely completely different. There would be mass chaos and looting and, and, and destruction. And whoever came out of that would live in a completely different world. I think this sort of thing is inevitable. It's inevitably cyclical about, about, uh, the, the, the human species. And, and the funny thing is like, that'll happen. And then it's just a matter of time before the cycle kickstarts itself and goes, goes all over again, because humans are wired to innovate. We're wired to create and, and creation expresses itself as technology. And so, so it's, there's, there's an inevitability to this. So like I said before, you know, I'll say kind of tongue in cheek that the enlightenment was a mistake. The enlightenment was also inevitable and just the same, the level of the, 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 the corruption of the technology we have today was also inevitable. And the collapse that comes from it is also inevitable. These are just inevitable aspects of being human and existing in, in this reality. And so I think that trying to, trying to stop them or prevent them is a, is a fool's errand. You're better equipped to just ensure that you can, you can ride it out and, uh, and that you and your family are, are, uh, are well situated to, um, at least survive from it, if not profit from it. Have you ever heard the song? It was a one hit wonder band from the sixties um, called in the year 2525 by Zager mm -hmm. and Evans. It's very interesting. And it's very, it's kind of a hilarious uh, looking at their naivete about technology development. Cause they're, it goes 25, 25, 35, 35, 45. They're going in thousand year increments showing how it's going to progress. And it's like, you'll pick your kids and pick your daughter from the bottom of a glass tube. Um, <laughs> you, you won't use your arms and legs. Everything you think, do and say will be in the pill you took today, but they should have been going like in decade increments. Cause right. it's so much faster than the song progressed, but it was very interesting. That's a song I heard when I was young. And I think it, it might've been one of my original red pills kind of looking at this whole technology mm. side of it. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend checking that out. Cause it, it really does parallel a lot of, what we're talking about and you got to give them a little credit there, uh in the year 25 25 um but given the fact it was like 64 or 65 like it's kind of interesting that they were thinking that far ahead seeing yeah it was like twilight zone era yeah it was like neural link and stuff a lot of that kind of things wow. they're, they're projecting already 1969 yeah, it was, oh it was nine it was later okay yeah but yeah check that one out it's a pretty uh pretty catchy tune okay but anyhow we're getting close to an hour and nick any uh, other questions or anything you want to close on um, I, I had one a minute ago, but I mean, I'm, I'm good for whenever. I don't know who has time constraints today, but uh, it'll, it'll come go back to me. As you want. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're, uh, we're up to our schedule. We're, we're going to leave for freedom fest on Tuesday, but now we're leaving tomorrow. So Ooh, nice. I just gotta do I'm, some I'm bummed here. that I, that we can't make it this year. I was, I was really hoping that we were going to be able to, but with the little man, it just, things just didn't mm -hmm. work out. Yeah. Well, I'm, kind of terrified we're bringing all four kids 12 hours <laughs> <laughs> it's uh my, my wife's upstairs right now just packing checklist making sure we have everything but it's gonna be you're gonna be 10 years older when you get back yes yeah you might as well up. be you might as well be traveling in a covered wagon i feel like that's gonna be an excursion <laughs> like that's all four you're kids gonna drive for 20 minutes and then have to stop someone's gotta oh. pee and we just did a road trip to, to in may we did a road trip from uh we live out east of la and we we drove up to Washington State, up through through California, all the way up to Washington State, and then uh, spent a week there visiting my family, and then drove across Washington, down across the corner, upper corner of Oregon, across the lower edge of of Idaho, and all the way down through Nevada to Vegas, and then all the way back again over the course of about sixteen days. And we oh, did wow. that with a six, seven, eight, seven month old, eight month old. And our expectation, like we were, we were fully anticipating. We'd allowed like four days to drive up to Washington to get there because our expectation was, you know, a seven, eight month old who, who to that time had hated being in his car seat. Every time we put him in it, he'd be in it for 10 minutes and he'd start crying. So we were expecting to, you know, drive for an hour and then stop for two hours and then drive for an hour and stop for two hours. So we'd allotted four days. As soon as we got him in his car seat, <laughs> and he slept like 80% of the time, just knocked out and slept almost the entire way. So we drove up there in a nice, relaxed, like two and a half days. <laughs> yeah, we we were, I thought we had it all planned out ahead of time. And then, of course, like you can never, you got to just expect the unexpected because my dad called me yesterday because they're, they're going to drive with us in a separate car. We got a minivan with four car seats in it, so we can't fit another person in there. And uh, my dad's like, hey, I can't go Tuesday. I'm going to go Wednesday because I have a, he had a job pop up for one of his clients that he can't 
he has to do. And um, I was like, well, you know, I kind of banking on having mom there to help with the kids. Like, we're going to have a day now without her. Like, he goes, oh, she can just ride with you. I'm like, no, she can't. Like, there's no room for an adult <laughs> to sit 12 hours in my car. So I looked into renting a passenger van, which I had no idea how badly that industry got rocked over COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, number one, there were none available in my area. And if there were, they were $2,000 a week right now. Oh, my God. That's yeah, insane. So I was like, dude, I could I, I could buy like a... 2004 Lincoln Continental limo for like four grand. (laughs) (laughs) That would be a better better solution. Um, But long story short, I ended up, uh, the reason we're leaving a day early is because our co-host Tyler, who's not here right now, he's leaving Monday because he schedules Airbnb a day earlier. So we're just going to leave with him and my mom's going to ride probably with my wife and I'll ride back and forth switching with them. But okay, um, you'll just have Tyler babysit then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we get an extra day of vacation. I took the day off anyways. And then uh, I think Nick and my dad are going to ride together. So nice. yeah, it's uh, but yeah, the last 24 fun. hours it's been stressful. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. Um, a lot of, a lot of people that have been on our show are going to be speaking there. So it'd be cool to meet them in person. Are you guys going to do shows live while you're up there? Yeah, I'm going to bring my computer. We'll see if we're going to do live um, because I have the capabilities of like just putting an SD card in my recorder and just saving on maybe doing like a because I don't know how much time we're going to have with each person. So if we get four people at 15 minutes, I might just make it one episode Mm. um, when I get home. But um, we'll play it by ear. It's going to be. I, uh, I'm i thinking about doing some some wild card stuff because we're there as media doing interviews. And I just want to go wild card and like start asking Dave Rubin what he thinks about Tower Seven, just like stuff like that, you know, like some Alex Jones style. Like, <laughs> I want to do something like that, but I don't know how the uh, organization would feel about it if we, you know, betray their trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Might as well. I don't want to be milk toast, just answering like, so "How do you feel about the event this year?" Like, boring, you know? Right. Yeah. So that, that just. Uh, it's like levels up the difficulty. So you have to figure out how to be creative without going full Alex Jones. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have yeah. you seen the documents? <laughs> yeah. It'll be, so yeah, no, that'll be fun. Dude. I had a, I had one more question on topic here, but it's, it, it escaped me. I, I was like trying to hold on to it. I should start taking notes. You know who does that is a uh, Buck Johnson. He mm-hmm. like actually takes notes. Like, like even when he was doing like our interview, he was like making sure he hit everything. And like, damn, this guy's, thorough mm. i he's need a, a little bit more of that man. he's, he's good. an yeah, absolute he, boss he yep yeah a lot of these uh we've spent so many cool people doing this it's been a blast I'm sure yeah you i mean your yeah. show's been growing really big i mean i think the first time you were on here i was saying like are you gonna start your own podcast You're like yeah everyone's telling me to do it and then boom <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, pretty hard out of the gate so. yeah yeah it was uh the that whole that whole lpmc liberty lockdown interview thing that like I went from on on Twitter, which is where I do the majority of my of my like shit posting and whatever. Uh, well, so I did I did Pete Quinones show and then Liberty Lockdown in about a week, and uh, I think I went from I just passed two thousand followers on Twitter just a, a, a day or so ago, and when I did the Pete Quinones episode, I think I was at like six hundred something mm-hmm. like that. So I picked up, um, and the and the bulk of that growth happened in the first you know, five days maybe after Pete's show. So I went from, I went from like 600 followers to like 1800 just in the space of like, of like five days. He's Pete. Pete doesn't just have a big audience. He has a rabid audience. No, you, you made such a wake that even just the one meme that I made about you with that guy screaming in the girl's ear, <laughs> I, I, I gained a hundred followers just from that tweet. <laughs> I, I had the ripple effect from that. <laughs> yeah. that was, Dave, Dave, I was going to say, Dave on Pete's show mentioned my meme, the underpants gnomes. He's like, and somebody had a, a meme where it's like, step one, take over the LP. Step two, I don't know. Step three, freedom. He's like, some stupid meme. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I, I felt at first I'm like, I feel bad. I feel like sad that Dave is like making fun of my meme. And then I'm, I just like laughed out loud, like after the absurdity of it. I'm like, I'm just shit posting. <laughs> right. like, we're all like kind of like, you know, causing little ripple effects. And, but and, the and whole also thing, so. like, like Nick's meme was a hundred percent neutral. He just said like, for those not following the drama, here's a meme representation of the argument against the takeover. <laughs> yeah. So right. he, like, he even put that in the caption, but then, yeah, I was listening to Pete's episode with Dave and I'm like, holy shit. Like we just rocked the boat. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It was like, it was kind of like a, it's like a Rorschach test where uh, whoever, who, everyone who saw that meme 
read into it their own uh yeah. their own perception of the of the situation it was yeah. weird like that that whole you know week or so after that and even since then like even still today i mean it's been almost was it like three weeks since we did four almost four weeks since we did that episode even today i'll just be scrolling through twitter and i'll randomly see people talking about me who i've never heard of and and who are are you know i don't want to say they're nobodies but they're just you know just random people this isn't like uh it is like other people in the podcasting space or something like that. It's just random, random people. Oh, that King Pilled guy or, mm -hmm. you know, the stop being poor guy stop or being, something like stop that. Stop being poor daily on my feed. People just, it, yeah, just <laughs> it's just, it's, just it's, it. it's weird how you can, how, uh, you know, I, I, I don't feel like I'm, you know, anything all that special. I'm just some guy that's just shooting off his mouth. And yet, like you said, it's like ripples. Like it's somehow mm -hmm. it, you, you, you tweak one little thing and everything ripples out throughout the entire community. And, uh, it's yeah. pretty cool. It's 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 a it's a good lesson in, uh, in in like human culture, like how how culture uh, develops and changes, and and that it 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 has a life of its own. It's got it, it moves as its own, uh, like the like the the culture of a a subgroup has its own personality, kind of. And yeah, that that reminds me of a word real quick that I um, related to one of the things we were talking about. Let me make sure I have it spelled right. It's an Egregore, which is a it's an occult concept representing a distinct non-physical entity that arises from a collective group of people. Historically, the concept referred to angelic beings or watchers and the specific rituals and practices associated with them, it, namely within Enochian tradition. So if you get like uh, Genesis six with the the, the Nephilim and uh, uh, the giants in the Bible, all that kind of thing, that's kind of a, a reference to this. But that that concept there is what sparked a tweet that I did uh, the other day. I said, uh, hypothesis, ideological possession is inevitable. Um, ideological possession being, a, Jordan Peterson is the one who really popularized that term, I think, uh, basically where you're, you're captured by your ideology. I said, it's inevitable. Attempting to eliminate ideological possession is a form of ideological possession. You get that same <laughs> meta thing there. I, it's like once you see these like meta, like like paradoxes, kind of. You start seeing them all over the place. So the attempt to eliminate an ideological possession is a form of ideological possession. The question isn't whether or not you will be possessed; rather, which ideology will possess you. And and that that kind of is is I think probably challenging to most people when they hear that. Uh, but then lots of people are aware of the phrase: people don't have ideas; ideas have people, uh, which is a, a Jungian phrase. And that that sentence that quote took on a whole new meaning to me when i encountered this term of the the egg i don't know if it's egregore or egregory um it's e-g-r-e-g-o-r-e -E -E. um but that that concept is it's basically like each and each like a group of people has its own consciousness and that consciousness is itself a an entity it's a it's a non-physical entity, but it's an entity just the same. And once you, I think once you kind of start going down this rabbit hole, once you, if you just kind of take that idea and just play with it, just kind of let it, let, let it sit there and marinate. And you think about ideologies and, and people who are adherents to an ideology, they are in a literal sense, um, a part or a manifestation of an entity that has yeah. its own goals and desires and then within Christianity, then within the with the Christian concept, Christians talk about um, wanting to be like indwelled by the Holy Spirit or being being motivated by the Holy Spirit. You'll say that the the church is the body of Christ. These are phrases that Christians are very familiar with. When you think of it in this sense, the church is the body of Christ. Yeah, you you are a literal manifestation of the body of Christ when you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. That conceptualization of, of Christianity is something that I'd never encountered. I never even thought of it that way. That it could like in, in a in a very literal, practical, like like historical sense. And uh so that it, it was going down the Eastern Orthodoxy rabbit hole is kind of what has led me to uh I've I've basically been rediscovering Christianity and re-understanding the whole um the, the 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 metaphysical worldview of the Bible, I guess you would say. Yeah. You know, I, I remember uh, sort of what came back to me. Um, one of the or one of the the points I wanted to to cover. Um, I forgot who you said had the idea that 
our brains were basically antennas and they were picking up these these frequencies yeah. and that was consciousness. I know that Nikola Tesla had a very similar idea about just ideas in general. And I think that some people uh, and first of all, this is kind of it's pretty crazy when you think about it. It sounds it sounds really condescending, but I know like Michael Malice has made this point before that some people just have bad antennas and they're not really there, like possibly a significant part of the population. Right. To me, it's like I can't I can't imagine not being interested in this conversation. I can't fathom the idea that like, aren't you uh, blown away that you're just like experiencing reality right now? Isn't that like magic to you? And like that concept of magic, I remember uh, hearing Vin Armani talk about it of like, you know, we need to to create some magic. It's like, to me, like, you know, a three-year-old playing with a ball is magic. Like when you turn on the lights and it works, that's magic. Um, like when I, a lot of times when I, when I'm teaching jujitsu and there's like a really cool move that just works and it seems really bizarre, but it feels like, like a puzzle piece clicking in and people are like, Oh wow. I'm like, yeah, it's magic. Like magic is a really powerful word. It's like, it, it really captures like, it's like, yeah, we don't fully understand this thing, but it's real and it's undeniably real. And, uh, to, to bring it back. No, that's pretty much the point I wanted to cover. Basically. Yeah. The consciousness thing. Um, what's funny is, is even uh so Jacob Dylan, Bob Dylan's son was on Rogan the other day and he yeah. was talking about just writing songs. He said the same thing about antennas, like he can't explain like when a song comes to you as a musician. Like it just comes, it's like, well, it, it I thought of it, but this just like streamed out of me in 15 minutes. Like it just you channeled this. And it's like it said the same thing about like it's the antenna type concept. And I'm sure anyone that's in the sphere can kind of relate to that just with when you kind of put your thoughts into words really quick with something that's that's developing in front of you, which um, you know, you see a lot of the, you guys do that on Twitter and everything, but it's, a, it's such an interesting concept too. Cause it's some people, like you said, just don't have it at all. It's like, they're just getting radio static. It's like they can only receive a single channel. Yeah. And like, yeah. and maybe that's what the NPC, like an NPC, the NPC meme, like that's what an NPC is. It's like someone who's, whose receiver is only capable of being tuned into a, to a single channel and they can't. It's like if you can't dial, if you can't move your your dial through other channels, then you don't have, you can't like contextualize anything. So you just kind of turn into like a mindless automaton. Oh, they just uh, eat Applebee's and they they watch American <laughs> Idol or Big Bang Theory. Yeah. There was a, a video, it was, I was scrolling through Twitter this morning. There was a video of this, this uh, dude was like interviewing this chick and uh, she was talking about like how smart she is and how she like majored in educate or in history and stuff. And then he asked her how long a decade is. And she said 12 years. <laughs> and, and they're all like laughing at her and everything. She's like, wait, wait, no, what? What it was, it's, it's like, oh, what did what did Abraham Lincoln said said four score and seven and and no, no, a decade, deck, deck. It, it's a hundred, a hundred years. Oh, that's no. what it is. And he's like, well, what about a century? And she's like, oh, uh, I don't, um, uh, a million. I don't know. Like, it was, it was. <laughs> I, and I'm sitting here watching this, and I'm like, this person votes. Yeah. Like this person is treated as the same like being as like a, a nuclear physicist or something, but, but there's just like, it, it, there's nothing there. I, and I don't under like, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't understand how to, how to, how to, how to conceptualize that. I don't know how to, how to relate to someone like that. Apart from it's, it's, it's a really good manifestation of, of uh, the Pareto principle, the, the like 80, 20 rule that like 80% of people are going to follow the other 20%. And that's, that's, the eighty percent, that type of person that just that is is uh, I don't I don't want to be too hard on her because of like not knowing one word, but it's like you could tell from the whole her whole demeanor. I've seen these types of people before that are just they exist in a completely fundamentally different reality from us. And like watching this conversation, that type of person would just like they wouldn't even even connect with this conversation at all. Like you said, Nick, like I can't understand not connecting to this this conversation but then there's there's this quote any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic which is a arthur c clark uh quote and we talked about that um like jacob dylan and 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 like receiving the song and people talk about like creative people talk about that all the time that like something just came to them and it just it's just like kind of appeared that would be like uh uh like i think that's when people talk about inspiration that's what they're saying it's like somehow they're their receiver was like, it was like kind of fuzzy and kind of breaking up and everything. And all of a sudden it's just like, boop, they found that right spot. 
and they just got this crystal clear like thing that popped right in their head. And it's like, like you said, like a puzzle piece, it clicks in and suddenly everything changes. It's almost like you, you get this new puzzle piece and you click it in there and suddenly you can receive even more channels than you could before. Uh, do you, and, yeah. do you believe that, I mean, like that humans have sort of like a, an ESP sixth sense kind of thing where like, you know, like the, uh, the, the men who stare at goats where people can feel eyes on them and they train snipers to not look at their target until they're ready to shoot. Do you think that there's some sort of sense that we don't understand? Because speaking of Jacob Dylan, weird segue, but I have a quick story. Mike oh, yeah, remembers this, it. This is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, but is that more or less like you believe that there's something we don't understand? Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, this is like years ago. I was probably like 20 years old. Um, Mike had bought a car. He bought like a Lincoln aviator or something. And Mike and I, we like Mike is huge into music has, has been since we were kids and you know, by proxy. So am I like, I could name hundreds of artists and like thousands of songs. And I remember we were in this car that Mike just bought and he's like, Oh, the lady left her CD in there. It's like a mixtape. He's like, I don't know any of the music except for, uh, and he said, except for, and then one headlight by the wallflowers, Jacob Dylan's band, it just started playing in my head. And I, I was like, I was starting to say it out loud. And then he said it and he, he just had to take my word for it. I'm like, I knew you were going to say one headlight by the wallflowers, like this obscure song that like we both kind of like, but I said, what the fuck it was the first yeah. thing I said, like, what? <laughs> like, he, he said it in unison with me. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And we've had like two other weird things like that. I can't remember what the other ones were. That was the most recent one, but it was, yeah, it just, you wonder it's like, you know, we're brothers and I hear telepathy stuff. And I'm trying to look for that in my twins now. Like, I don't know if there's any merit to that stuff, but I hear a lot about it. And That's what I was going to say is that yeah. is there's people like all kinds of twins talk about, like basically being able to like, they, they know when something happened to the other one, they, there's mm -hmm. a, there's a sense there that, that they, uh, that they, they picked up on somehow. And I, there's, there's so many stories about this kind of thing. There's it, it's happened to so many people, various you know, uh, I guess various manifestations of this type of phenomenon you're talking about that I, uh, you know, I think it, it's, it would be silly to say that, oh, there's nothing to that. It's just a coincidence or something like that. It's like, that's, if you, if you want to claim to be uh, an empiricist or something, then you can't just write all these off as just a bunch of anecdotes. Like this is, this is clearly data. You know, mm -hmm. um, when we, when we went to find out the gender of our baby yesterday, um, the lady that was doing the ultrasound, the owner of this place, she, she, we were talking and, and my wife is like, Oh, I knew it, like I had a feeling it was a girl and blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, I know it was a 50% chance anyway. And then she goes, she's like, yeah, a lot of people, she's like, you know, half the people say like, Oh, I knew it. She's like, but everybody knows it's just a coin toss. Like it's, it's one or the other. And she goes, except for little kids. And she's been doing this for like 40 years. And she goes, little kids, like the siblings of the pregnant woman or the, the baby being born. She's like kids, like under the age of four, she goes, I don't know what percentage it is, but it's significantly higher than 50% that they know that they're going to have a brother or sister. She's like, it's most of the time they are correct. And it's, it's way over half. She's like, they are tapped into something. And I did not get a, a mystical vibe from this lady at all. She's like, just saying this, as uh this very like empiricism uh point of view like she's been doing this forever and little kids know what like if they're gonna have a brother or sister before anybody else knows yeah. and she said they also know if there's twins coming she goes i can't tell you how many times i've said like or you know little kids have told her like like oh yeah mommy there's there's no no she's not having a baby she's having two babies like like in the early weeks of the pregnancy and they're right like it's, so it's, I think there is something, I don't know why, but maybe cause kids are like closer to that source, but they seem to be tapped into like whatever that is. Yeah. yeah. My, uh, my son actually, he's going to be four, but he's really close with Nick. Um, and just, just, you know, he's his favorite uncle every time he comes over, he's always all over Nick. And, uh, he, when we found out Nick was having a baby, I was like, Oh, uncle Nick's going to have a baby. And said, is it going to be a boy or a girl? And usually like a little boy just out of bias, like wants another boy cousin. He's already outnumbered now six to three in our family with or cousins, like it's six girls and three boys now. Um, so he didn't want like he would have wanted a boy if he could have picked. But right away from day one, we found out Nick was having a baby. He goes, it's a girl. He's like, it's going to wow. be a girl. Like, he, he never says it's going to be a boy. And like, I kind of felt the same way for some reason. I just couldn't imagine it being a boy. <laughs> but, but then Henry saying it too, just kind of doubled down. I was like. I don't know. I'm gonna stick with Henry on this one. And sure enough, Nick found out yesterday and I was like, never had a doubt. 
We knew. I, I just, I had a gut feeling when they were going in there, like doing the ultrasound. I'm like, there's not going to be a wiener in there. There's just no chance. Like, I just had this weird, like, you know, it's just, that's, that's how I felt about it. It's a, uh, uh, I, I'm sure that you could probably, you know, if we studied it long enough or we were able to, to have the right perspective on it or something, you know, I'm, I'm sure we would get to the point where we, would discover it, it has something to do with like hormones or something. It's just, there's like a, 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 or a pheromone or something like that, that, that the, the, the mother is putting off that somehow the babies are picking up on it and they're more, or the kids are picking up on it and they're more, more tapped into it. But I, I think that you're absolutely right that there's something about children being, being closer to that source. And that part of, I think part of our, civilizational process part of the the development and maturation is us having that sense uh being it, that, that that sense in us is is like is is uh enculturated out of us somehow the through the process of, mm-hmm. of growing up and being around adults some, we we lose that sense and it and it has to do with uh the i, I think something about i don't know if it has to do with the you know, hormones in the water or, uh, public or schooling, public schooling. Yeah. Or like, <laughs> there could be any number of things. And I don't know if it's a natural sense or if it's a, that's a natural process as well, that, that it's just kind of natural that children are going to be more tapped into that. And as they, as they, uh, as they grow up, like eventually you're going to kind of move away from it. Maybe there's like specific practices that you have to keep up that you can stay tapped into something like that. And because, and it's like, once you get, like all it would take would be one generation to depart from retaining that sense and every generation after it wouldn't because from then on the adults as they're raising the children if the adults have lost that sense and they don't have the ability the capacity to retain it then they're just going to they're going to basically intentionally or not they're going to essentially like beat it out of the child the child's going to lose it as well because they don't use it there's a really interesting book um it goes into a lot more than this but uh, there's a, the book's called my big toe awakening, a trilogy, unifying philosophy, physics, and metaphysics. It's written by a nuclear physicist named Thomas Campbell. And so, I mean, he, so he's a nuclear physicist. He's not, he's not a, a, a crackpot necessarily. Um, and if you, if, if you read the book, you can just, especially if you get the audiobook and you hear him read, he, he seems like a very reasonable person. Um, and, and toe is, is it stands for theory of everything. Uh, which is kind of like the forefront of, of physics right now is, is attempting to come up with with a, a something that unifies um, the uh, like Einsteinian relativity, I think, with quantum mechanics because the two of them are 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 at at odds right now, and nobody's been able to unify them. So this is his attempt at doing it. And I haven't read the whole thing, but it, toward the beginning of the first book of this of the trilogy, he describes his son and. Uh, experience as he was growing up where his son was able to like, like, like astrally project at night uh, when he would go to sleep and, and that he, the the author was, he, he, I don't want to spoil a lot of the book. He went through a process where he kind of trained himself to be able to do that as well. So he and his son would meet each other astrally in the middle of the night and they would go like go around and do stuff all throughout the night while their bodies were still back at home. Like he talked about like, like, <laughs> like, like going into the ocean and swimming through a whale um, was like one of the things that he described. And it seems completely preposterous as you listen to him describe it. He, he has a lot of, of uh, really detailed, elaborate um, explanations and justifications for everything. And, um, I, I don't have any reason to doubt him apart from, I just don't have any experience that would verify it. But, uh, what he talks about in that is this, that, that this is a, a capacity that children have. Children are able to, they have this connection to the metaphysical or spiritual or divine, whatever, whatever you want to call it, the, the non-physical realm. And they, they encounter it and interact with it very readily as children, but then, as they grow up and as they spend more time around adults who have no connection to it at all, then they kind of lose that ability. Uh, so that kind of relates to relates to this, perhaps something about being born is like when you're born, that's when you transition from the metaphysical to the physical, maybe like your, maybe your spirit or your soul or something kind of exists prior to your birth. And then you cross over into the physical plane. And so for a period of time, you're still 
able to access or connect with the metaphysical, but eventually the further away you get from that transition point, you kind of lose it. I don't know if that's a, uh, if there's any validity to that, but, uh, again, right now that might seem like magic. That might seem like total woo woo, but if you were to develop a series of practices, like some rituals that enabled you to, to like train that muscle or to hone that ability, that would be essentially a technology that you had developed. And then it goes from being magic to just technology. So this, this sort of thing is, is just, is completely fascinating to me. And I don't see any reason why it has to be uh, just dismissed as, as not possible. I, I think it could be entirely <clears throat> reasonable. Oh yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I've, heard, I've even heard a lot about like um, people who, when kids have like, kind of talking about a past life when they're first learning to talk, they'll mm -hmm. bring out details or they have no no reason they should know these words or these details. And once again, those could all just be looking too deep into it, but there's so many of those. Like I've talked to people anecdotally in my own life that have had just crazy stories about their kids. And then like by the time they're like five, they completely stop doing it and they have no recollection of it. Or but, they'll describe something happening in that building. They'll be like, they'll say, oh, like the, the, the little girl in the red dress or, you know, something like that. Yep. And then people will find out later on that, that prior to them, you know, a hundred years ago, there was, there was that exact person existed in that, in that house. And it's like somehow the, per, the, the kid was accessing that memory or, or encountering that spirit or, you know, again, I mean, this could be like timelines, like there's some sort of like, uh, uh, different, uh, 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 like coexistent timelines that are somehow getting merged or, or, or crossing into each other or mashing up somehow. And, um, you know, so, yeah. somehow something happens where you're able to bridge both timelines and you're able to access both events at the same time or something like that. All of this stuff is just, it's fascinating. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and who knows if 50 years from now, there'll be some major breakthrough and we'll understand what it is and, and, you know, be able to encounter it and, 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 and manipulate it and, 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 you know, relate to it in some way. I kind of suspect that, that, uh, I don't know. I have my doubts that that's ever going to happen. I think it's going to continue being a mystery to us for, for a long time, but right. I, I think it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, you mentioned like uh, the idea of the force and in general, how people have this sort of intuition to want to believe in a higher power. And to me, it's like, you look at star Wars, like the force, it's just like this fictional magical thing. And it's like, why were billions of people enchanted by that idea and like, so sucked into it. And I think it is because we we have some sort of gut feeling that there is something approximating that thing that exists in reality. And, you know, talking about uh, kids um, and, and like their senses, my grandma told me that when I was uh, like three or four years old, I, I was at her house and I drew a picture of like my family and then a bird. And she goes, and I'm like, oh, grandma, look at this. This is dad and Mike and blah, blah, blah. And then I pointed at the bird and I said, and that was me when I was a bird. And she's like, what <laughs> like it was just, like or not not like what like she wasn't freaked out but she seemed i was like dead serious and like matter of fact i'm like okay like and then uh mike's son he's had a couple weird things like that which are more creepy like he's got like a you know the shining kind of senses <laughs> what henry's done was, was it with the uh what did he see in the room mike uh, what was the one he, this is in my old house probably moved. He was, no, he said it was the broom, something about the broom. Like the guy told him to do it or something. Oh, or I can't yeah. remember what it was. Yeah. He had some weird ones. The, the one that stuck out to me though, was at my old house. He got up out, before the sun came up. It was like four 40 in the morning and we had a tri level. He goes down one step of stairs and then goes down to like our sub level and stands down and looks and goes, hi, hi. And my wife and I are like, who are you talking to? And he just goes, guy. <laughs> and we're like what the hell? It's so like flip all the lights on and nothing there. But he was like he was staring directly at something. Maybe he's just imagining a figure. But yeah, he's had some weird, odd stuff like that. But dude, he he scared he scared me at our parents' house. He's like he's like Uncle Nick. He's like there's a monster in the basement. I'm like yeah, you want me to come beat him up? And he's like it's like I'll show you. And like we we go down. We're like halfway down the stairs, and he stops and he looks at me like dead in the eyes. He's like Uncle Nick, it's a real monster. And I'm like okay we're downstairs and i like peek into one room like is he in here you want me to get him he's like it's like uncle nick he's like i don't think you can beat him he's like he bigger than you i'm like yeah he's like he's stronger too and i'm like all right time to go upstairs like <laughs> it's like <laughs> freaking me out dude. Like, he just had this look of seriousness in his eyes uh, like he was he actually saw something you know yeah, but man, man you mentioned uh out. you mentioned at the top of the show about like how you every decision you make you think about your son now 
yeah. and and how it's going to impact them. Like that gets crazier once he starts talking and can repeat things and has like his own original thought and like the most innocent things. Like it's crazy what they'll retain and pick up on like a sponge. Like why well, I, I was like two and a half. I think we went and saw pre COVID went and saw monster trucks at our local arena and he's been a gearhead since day one. And he just loved it and like talked about it every month after till to this day, he brings it up occasionally, but, um, the then COVID happened and there was no monster truck circuit last year. So he kept wanting to go see him again. And he kept doing the why, why, why he's like, he's like, why can't we see him? Like, when are they coming? He's like, we go back. I was like, no, there, there are no monster trucks. Well, why? I said, cause they won't let him race. And he said, well, who, and out of just sarcasm and frustration, I said, the commies, like, you know, the commies shut everything down. <laughs> so <laughs> I think nothing of it. He just scratched his head and walked away. And like four or five weeks later, he's in the back of the minivan just driving on the road. And he goes, daddy. I said, yeah. He goes, I'm going to find the commies. I'm going to stomp them with my big shoes and say, Hey, give me back my monster trucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Over a month later. And I'm like, Oh shit, this kid can't go to public. Also <laughs> said he was going <laughs> to, I don't know if we should even say this on the stream, but also said he was going to give him a ride on his sword. <laughs> He's like going to give him a ride on my sword. <laughs> like, You're raising yeah. a little Chad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you guys right. have either of you guys ever uh, had any uh, psychedelic experiences? No. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's uh, something. <laughs> yeah, so, that's a that's a long story, but yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, okay, yeah. I, 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 I know what you mean. My, really quick, my wife needs help with one of my kids, but he doesn't keep chatting. Okay, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, the uh, so you know how when you when you have that when you're going through a, a, a psychedelic experience you it, it feels like you just activated senses that you didn't know you had whether yes. it's like seeing it's, it, you you get this sense of of just being absolutely inundated with information that you normally aren't aware of and there's this distinct sense that that information is always inundating you you're just not aware of it and i i had this theory kind of that that is what it's like to be a child. Like a, when a child is born, yeah, they, they experience the world as someone who's in a psychedelic trip. That's why they get so easily overwhelmed. That's why they have, you know, it, it's so hard for them to, to, to do different things and their coordination stuff. They have to develop it. And one thing that is, is, is well known is that our, our faculties, our, our, our sense making faculties are not, um, they are, uh, uh, uh filtering mechanisms. Yes. So they they yeah. reduce the amount of information that's coming into you. So the the process of of growth and maturity is is literally a matter of reducing the amount of information that come that that you're aware of because you have to prioritize. You have to prioritize the information that is is encountering you. You have to prioritize uh, uh, what information you're going to pay attention to and what you're just going to ignore. So when your brain is developing, as your brain is quote unquote maturing what it's doing is it's it's learning how to prioritize the information around you and then ignore and, and, and cast aside everything else. So it wouldn't at all be surprising to me if this sort of sense, this sort of like sixth sense or whatever, doesn't end up, like it, it's not that useful uh, for a child. And so eventually, and, and because the rest of us don't have it, we don't emphasize it. We don't focus on helping the child retain that sense. So they just naturally lose it as they, as they get older. Cause the, the process of growth and maturity is literally turning off your senses. It's turning off and focusing and refining your senses. So that would, that would make sense to me. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of validity to that. And I know like, uh, I, I've heard that idea before and they, basically they're saying like, if your brain was just like producing DMT all day, you're not going to be very good at like making a shelter and hunting, you right. know? So, so it's like, like you said, it's a filtering mechanism and like, we kind of like, I think with kids, if that is the case, then it sort of like atrophies over the years. And right. we actually just watched uh, the sequel where we watched the shining and then the sequel to the shining um, Dr. Sleep that has Ewan McGregor. That's the star. And that's kind of a, the theme in the show that like kids have the shining, they have like this sense and then it atrophies over the years. And, uh, and, and, you know, terms of like the psychedelic experience, I think that there's a good chance that that's how it works. And they say that we only use like 20% of our brains or whatever. And it's like, okay, well, what is, what is the rest of that for? First of all, I don't, I'm not going to lie. I don't really understand what that means. Only use 20% of it. Like, so there's only neurons firing in a certain part, but, um, 
yeah, I, I would not be surprised if that was the case. It makes a lot of sense to me. I know that they've done like MRIs of people who are on, on like a mushroom trip or something and they can, they can uh, depict however they can show uh, the, like the, the neurons firing and connecting to each other. I mean, I, I sound like a total noob talking about this, but like I've, I've seen the pictures before, like the charts where they show um, there's like all these different um, receptors and they're all like talking to each other, like communicating mm -hmm. with each other. And there's like the normal brain and they're just, there's like specific ones are connected to specific ones in specific ways. And then there's the brain on shrooms and they're all connected in all kinds of different ways. And so it's like, it's like it opens the floodgates and you get um, like neurons or whatever that fire that connects to each other in ways they don't normally. And this is why it it, it is uh, experience, the, the subjective experience of it is making connections that you wouldn't have normally made. And a way that I've kind of visualized it for myself and my, my experience is it's kind of like when, you, uh, when you're when you on a, a, a ski lift and you get to the top of the hill you, uh, you or snowboarding, you, you push yourself off the chair and there's natural grooves that are carved into the snow. And those grooves lead you off into different trails. And there's a degree to which you can just kind of just push yourself off and just let your skis or your snowboard guide you. And it'll, it'll just kind of follow these grooves down the hill. And, um, and even if it's not exactly that way on a mountain hill, you could kind of imagine it that way, that that's how your brain functions by just naturally, uh, following these grooves. Every, every time you think about a certain subject, your brain naturally thinks about it in the same linear way. But then a psychedelic experience, whether you do it, whether you have it from a, a, a drug or for some, so from other uh, way of accessing that experience, it's kind of like getting a blizzard that completely floods. Man, now I want some Dairy Queen. It, it completely, <laughs> it completely covers all of those trails. And now you, it's like you, you had this blizzard that came, and you take, you ride the chairlift up to the top, and you get up there, and it's like your 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 skis or snowboard can go anywhere. It can take any new trail, and it can carve new trails, and you can go new directions. And so then you have a completely different experience going down the hill. That's kind of how. Um, my experience of psychedelics has been that it, it sort of just kind of whited out everything on my brain and then allowed my brain to, to sort of reinvent all of the like cognitive habits that, that I, uh, that I have. So, uh, so yeah, I think that there's definitely something to this idea that, uh, that, that children are basic children basically come out of the womb tripping balls. <laughs> and the process of the process of, of of adapting to reality and and growing and maturing is that their their minds are developing uh, uh, filtering processes that filter out everything that's non essential and uh, within this material reality and especially in a in a very material age they're naturally going to like as like a kid will say something like. Um, a kid might say, oh, there's a monster under my bed. And you're kind of like, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, there's not actually a monster under your bed. So we just kind of like patronize them or whatever. And then, but like, if you took that very seriously and you were like, okay, what does the monster look like? What's he doing? What What is he saying to you? How is he acting? And if you treated it as if it was real, I'll bet you the kid would retain that, that, that kind of sense. The problem is you're now you're setting up nobody else is doing that with their kids now you're setting up your kid to be a, a total pariah yeah and like paranoid so you're creating like a like a negative selection pressure against retaining that so i'm sure these these sort of dynamics and 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 phenomena over over the course of generations have have completely like calcified our ability to use our brains in this way and, uh, and, and, and I don't know if that's something that over the next decades or something, we're going to kind of re recover. Maybe that's an, that's a new forefront of innovation. I know that psychedelics are becoming within normal academia and stuff. Psychedelics are becoming all the rage to study how they, how they work with, with helping people, uh, through like breaking habits and depression and all that kind of thing, PTSD. So, um, it's possible that we're right on the forefront of some sort of major innovation on, on, on this front. And people are going to start learning how to, how to tap into their ESP. I'm not really all that confident that that's going to be super productive because I think there's a lot of things out there that you can tap into that you're probably better off not being tapped into. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just hit me. That's kind of off uh, subject, but circling back to what we were talking about earlier with the antenna concept is 
wouldn't that so well explain the relationship between like the the autism stereotype with libertarians like they're all tuned into these frequencies that nobody else is yeah like they're hyper aware of the economy and all these things that no, no one's like that's not even on my station i've never heard this song what's what's inflation you know <laughs> like, right yeah that's like that's a really good way to conceptualize that and once, yeah. once you realize that then you also understand if you want to be persuasive to people you have to be able to, to you have to be able to access the frequencies that they're tuned into yeah that's what that's what communication is communication is connecting to the frequencies that everyone else is connected to and then presenting ideas in a way that's compelling to them this is why I'm convinced that the, the libertarian movement as it exists right now isn't equipped to actually accomplish what libertarians claim to want to accomplish, especially with the, you know, the taking over the LP and all that, because the, the, the posture is um, how can I – let me think about this. The posture is how can I get other people to tune into my frequency rather than – how can I tune into everyone else's frequency? And, and for that reason, it's like, if you want people to tune into your frequency, you have to give them a reason to. And if you're not giving them a compelling reason to, and, and like to, 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 for it to be compelling, you have to tune into their frequency. Right. You have so to, that's, you have that's to. That's what the left does. Like the BLM right. and Antifa, they channeled it. I mean, they came in like, we're going to go into the public schools and you're going to accept this as the only truth. And everyone's like, okay, okay. We can't be on the contrary of this because it's popular. Right. They so. took they, they you know they, in, in a literal sense and in a in a uh, um like a symbolic sense they they took over all the frequencies yeah and they they used a message that's adapted to uh to, that, that that um is is adapted to uh, dominating those frequencies it's a very it, it it strikes at the like the heart of the human soul kind of the the emotional appeals and all that kind of thing it's a message that's well crafted to uh, it's it's well engineered to accomplish their their goals. So if your response to that is just we're going to broadcast to our own frequency, but we're going to do it even louder, you're not. That's not that's not going to move the needle. You've you've got to be able to pour over into their frequency, and you have to be able to you have to understand where they're coming from. You have to, which is where it, you know, it starts with empathy. Empathy is a really, really powerful weapon. It's a powerful tool. And in the fallout, I know we, we were not really going to get into this, but in the fallout of that uh, that interview, I had a lot of people who came, who, who I, I can't, they just going through my mentions, came across them who basically were expressing the sentiment of um, everyone else is fucked up. Why do I have to change? And, you know, they're the ones who have the problem, so they should have to change. Why do I need to adapt my message to them? And I'm like, that's you know you're that that's emblematic of the, the the problem with the the libertarian messaging that there isn't this this like respect or concern or consideration for the people that libertarians are trying to message to because they're like oh well we've already got all the answers and it's just a matter of getting everybody else to just accept our answers well if that's the route that you're going to take you're going to have to do it by force <laughs> yeah and and i think that's a a like a broader problem that you just spoke to um, with the whole libertarian, like just as individuals being able to message to people. And I, I pride myself. I've, uh, you know, as far as selling libertarian ideas, I've had some success with just people I know in my life about reaching them. And I think that like you mentioned, like empathy is a really powerful tool, like actually try to put yourself, uh, you know, in this person's shoes and see what their concerns are in their day-to-day -day life. And then you can actually kind of speak to them in that way. But if you just go on and on about how like, you know, the Fed was created like in the, the dead of night in 1913 and this was never supposed to happen and all the founders, people are like, mm -hmm. what the fuck are you talking about? Like, I don't care about any of this, you know, and I can uh, help me pay my bills. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So it's, you know, I think being able to speak to people and uh, Tho Bishop has actually been talking about that idea too, where he's like, he's like, why not like be a little subversive, like get into these other groups that these, these groups that have energy right now and just kind of steer them, you know, like right. he's like, talk to the Q people and say like, oh yeah, the, the banking cabal anyway, what they're doing is keeping interest rates way too low. And here's why this is a problem. He's like, we shouldn't be like, like, no, you have to come to us. It's like, no, we have to go to people if we actually want to be successful selling any sort of ideas. Right. Right. And, and, and when you go to them even more, it isn't just go to them and sell your own ideas. It's go to them and sell them ideas they want to buy, the ideas they want to buy into. I think libertarians would do very well to, to 
get like training and marketing, marketing and advertising. Because like if you're marketing a product, like say you're you're uh, this is this is part of the problem of the 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 fact that that so many libertarian minded people are not entrepreneurs. They're just they're they're wage slaves themselves. They don't they don't have the entrepreneurial mindset. Once you get that entrepreneurial mindset, you realize if I have a product to sell people and they're not buying it, that's my problem. That's not their problem. That's my I need a better sales pitch. I either need to better I need a better product. I need a better sales pitch. Maybe I need to refine my copy. Maybe I need a better call to action. There's all different kinds of things that you can tweak to it. But right now, the libertarian call to action is non-existent. It does it's it's like okay. So say you get everyone's attention and you wake them all up. Now what? Now now what are they supposed to do? Join the LP? I, I, I don't I don't. There isn't. It, it, the state doesn't exist um, because people accept it. People accept it because it exists, and yeah. the, the 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 state the the, the 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 nature of the state doesn't give a shit about what people think about it. So getting people to wake up isn't going to change anything. If anything, you're actually going to get a much worse version of the state because now people aren't accepting it, so it needs to force itself upon them. And so you're you're going to create an even more. And that's part of the nature of the of the the democratic state that we have now, which is that it it has been fine fine tuned and engineered to use opposition to itself as a means for expanding its own power. So it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's like the, the fuel of the state today is opposition to it. And, and each time it's each time a new, uh, group comes like, look at like Trump was basically a, um, he was, he was a, when, when people look at him and they're like, oh, he was a statist or, you know, he's the, the dead or whatever else, they miss the fact that the the state as it exists right now is like a spiritual state. It's a it's a it's a, a view of the world. It's a it's a um, uh, it's like a metaphysical state of being that that a bunch of people, they're all enthralled with this uh, with with this uh, uh, concept of reality. And Trump did not participate in that. He he came in with a completely different view of reality and said the, the whole America first notion or you know immigration restrictionism or all these kinds of things. These were all um, hearkening toward a completely different conceptualization of uh, a government and its role and, and, and how it should be behaving. If you just look at the stuff on the surface, you miss the distinctly spiritual difference that underlied his messaging and his values and all of that. And what happened? The state used that opposition, that really powerful opposition to their spiritual essence, and it, they, they used it as an opportunity to level up. Uh, and so people look at that and they say, oh, well, Trump was a uh, um, Trump was just part of them or, or, or some of the, oh, he was a long game. He was a he was a, a um, uh, like a Manchurian candidate or something like that's that's over complexifying it. I think it's I think it's very simple. The state uses opposition to itself as op- an opportunity to expand itself. And so if your goal is to move beyond the state or to eliminate the state or, or, or diminish the state or whatever, you, you like you have to take that into, con- into consideration that y- you going and directly attacking it on its face is actually playing directly into its mechanism for expanding its own power. So you, you can't go launch yourself at the gates. You can't come out guns blazing you know, uh, with this, this, this posture of being directly antagonistic to the state, because what you're doing is providing it with fuel. You're giving it a reason to exist. See, we need to exist because there's all these radicals here. And if we didn't exist, then these radicals would take you over and enslave you. It doesn't matter what the truth is. What matters is the perception of the truth. And right now the state controls the perception of the truth. And you have to change that until you've changed people's perception of the truth then the actual uh, truth of your message or the actual um, goal that you express is, is irrelevant. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, that, that idea, it's like the, the equal but opposite reaction. Like if you're going to bring this adversarial energy to the relationship between you and the state or just the people in the state, the state is necessarily going to have to, uh, you know, have a defense mechanism, like increase their force to deal with it. And I remember maybe it was Thaddeus Russell's pod or podcast that Yarvin was on, but Yarvin, I'm always a sucker for a Lord of the Rings analogy. So he goes, he's like, if you don't have a plan to destroy the ring, don't fuck around. 
Like that's yes. and, and that's kind of like what the whole um you know, post-libertarian thing that's been kind of critical of the LPMC. That's why I'm open to hearing it. It's like, I think that's an idea that needs to be grappled with. Like, what are your, like, don't pick fights you can't win. That's not a good idea, right? It's like if an amateur fighter wanted to like, you know, oh, I'm going to get to fight, you know, Chris Weidman or some like top level MMA fighter. It'd be like, okay, cool that, you know, they have your attention and you, you get to fight them, but you realize that you're going to, this is going to end very badly for you if you don't actually have a chance of winning. So I think, uh, I, I don't know what the strategy is when it comes to actually achieving our, our ends. Um, but I think that just cavalierly going about trying to, uh, actually threaten the system, you know, without specific steps to victory could be a dangerous game. Yeah. Right. No. And, and, with that whole feud that happened with you, it was, it was like, it was interesting for us to watch. Cause I think for a lot of these people, it's the first time they've heard of you or, or, or you came on the scene to them when you were on Pete's show. But as long as you've been Jason's co-host, I've been listening to you for how many years. So like, and you've been on my show for your third time now. So it was like, I had a different perspective where I'm like, well, I know Matt's a smart dude. So if he's has a stance, he feels passionately about it. Um, but also I, I've been listening to Dave for years and I respect him too. And it's like, I'm, I'm listening. You guys are both very intelligent guys that, do your homework. And I was curious to hear the conversation, but um, it was incredible how divisive it got where people just kind of saw you as like a grifter or something with it. But it's like, I, I don't know. It was, it, it's, it is a, there's a lot of things you guys mentioned that had to be grappled with that hadn't been really responded to. Um, but yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's been different just hearing it from if they knew who you were going into it versus just some guy who came on the scene. And that's kind of right. like what, that that meme that I made was kind of like the average person looking at how just ridiculous this whole thing is where um, even, you know, as great as David is just caricaturing him as just the, a, com- a dirty comedy from Legion of Skanks, which he technically is, but right. he's a very brilliant yeah. guy. And then you and then Vin was a gigolo. <laughs> like the whole thing is like <laughs> <a> gigolo <laughs> wizard. <laughs> the whole thing is just like if I just showed this to one of my high school friends or one of my coworkers, they'd be like, what the fuck kind of world do you exist in? Like, who are these people? <laughs> it's know? a total tempest in a teapot. And that's yeah. like, that, that's, I think, I think that goes, that just goes to, to kind of substantiate what I'm saying that, that this is, uh, I think that, that, the that people within the LP, the LPMC, within the libertarian community at large really don't have a, a concept. There's this idea of, of Dunbar's number. That's like, uh, that we're human beings are, are optimized for groups of about 150 people. And, and I think it's because it's something like psychologically we can only, or, or cognitively, we can only retain like 150, approximately 150 or 200 distinct faces that we can remember. And beyond that point, it's like, it starts, we start stereotyping. We have to start categorizing according to stereotypes. It was, it was something along that, those lines. But uh, so, so Dunbar's number is, is, is a, is a real thing that has been, been well-documented as, as, um, it's difficult for going back to the whole idea of like a group of people being a manifestation of an entity um, of an actual like non-physical entity. Each, each group of people at a different size has a different behavior, a different set of characteristics. And we can't conceptualize 320 million people. Like we, we have no idea how many people that actually is. If you saw a crowd of 320 million people, <clears throat> your mind would, would short circuit. You wouldn't be able to process that many people. So when we, like if you go watch a, a movie or TV show or something like that, you'll see like even today, you'll see, um, what what's an example? Like 24, for example, is you'll see all these different things that are happening that are like major global scale events. But what's the cast? The cast is consistently, you know, maybe a hundred people or something like that. And there, everything that happens in the world happens within them. You'll see, uh, uh, how do you conceptualize this idea? It's like, uh, maybe like, like in like Spider-Man or something, you'll see this, this crowd of people that are all, um, all the events that are happening in the city are all happening within this, this, this portrayed crowd of a few hundred people, maybe something like that. And it's like the rest of the city, the rest of the millions of people kind of are just sort of like, um, like part of the terrain. They're just like part of the scenery. They don't actually, they aren't actually involved in what's happening, but 
in the in the real world, like we we can't fathom the number of people that are involved in uh in in a, in a normal polity. It's just an unfathomable number of people. So when you're talking about this from a democratic standpoint, where you're like, we need to start converting people to our way of seeing the world, that's a that's a Sisyphean task, unlike just about anything else. You could libertarians could double their numbers. And that would be a massive accomplishment to actually have every single libertarian person go convert one other person to being a libertarian. That would be a, that's a tremendous amount of work. That would be a, a massive accomplishment. And it would, it wouldn't even move the needle. It'd be a tiny little blip. You could, and you could double that and it would still be just a blip. You could double that. And you're still dealing with, with an, an insignificant subset of the population when you're operating from the democratic mindset. Now, if you took all of those people and you took them and you directed them into something targeted that's parallel to the state, you had them, um, instead of taking this organization of people that's like the entire polity of the United States, where when you interact with that, you're just one tiny little sliver of it. If you took that same number of people and you targeted it toward a new venture that doesn't have anybody invested in it right now, suddenly each individual action by each person there um, uh, uh, grows exponentially in terms of influence. So th this is kind of where, like you said, you, you, you don't know exactly what the answer is here. I think, Nick, you were the one that said that. You don't know exactly mm -hmm. you know, how to grapple with this going forward. I don't either. That's why I've, I've tried to be explicit that I don't have the answers. I don't know how to solve this problem. What I'm trying to point out is that we need people who are trying to solve this problem. The whole taking over the LP thing, that's something that you do after you've solved the problem. That's what you do when you say, we have a solution. Now it's just, we need, we need a marketing campaign to advertise our solution. We don't even have a solution. All we have is the state sucks. And the, the state is bad. The state is moral. The state is evil. Taxation is theft. All the, all the dogmas, we have those. But the reason that people patronize the state the reason the state exists as it does is because people want a state that does what the state does. People have demands. H.L. Mencken said the average man doesn't want uh, liberty. He just wants security. People want to be safe. They want to know that their bills are paid for. They want to know that they're not going to be attacked. They want to know that they can drive on the road and go to work and come home safely. Like they want very rudimentary basic things. And then they just want to be satiated. They just want to be satisfied with, with a hobby and with a community and, their, their demands are very simple. So if your solution to them doesn't provide those, those things that they want, they have no reason to buy into it. And right now, basically the libertarian message is become a revolutionary. Like become like, like come join this, come join this principled stand against tyranny. That's uncomfortable. That's people don't want to do that. People people don't want to go out of their way. People want someone who's going to tell them what they want to hear and they could go push the button and then go back to their life. That's that's what they want. So if you're coming to them with a message that says you need to sacrifice, you need to take responsibility for your own life. You need to check out of the system. You need to venture off into this unexplored territory. You know, now, we don't have any actual answers. That you you're just not going to get people to buy into that. It, to your point of that, is that what we're seeing right now in Paris and Cuba is those people who just wanted to be comfortable got really uncomfortable really fast. Right. Like with the, right. the vaccine passports, they said like, nope. So now all these people who just wanted to just go about their life and not not ruffle the feathers, they felt the need to take the stand now. So is that kind and, and, of what and, the, the well, and what kind of stand are they taking? What kind of stand are they taking? They're not saying government go away. They're saying government change the way that you're operating. They want the government mm -hmm. to go back within its box, and then they can go back to doing what they're doing. And you know, you might sure. get the revolutionary fervor that that, that that builds up where they are like, "Oh, we're going to storm the gates. We're going to overthrow the state." But if you if you survey history, you'll see that that revolutions, uh, number one, they tend to be extremely costly. They tend to be very bloody, and creating that level of social instability that suddenly is a uh, the, the narrative that is is told us about the functioning of 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 revolutions and the aftermath of it is 
you, you have to remember that the story that we're being told is the story that favors the people telling it and the people telling it are the people who won the revolution. So of course they're going to go back and they're going to, and they're going to say, Oh, it was all amazing and wonderful and great. And it was fantastic. And, and uh, you know, if it wasn't for us stepping in and winning the day, then, you know, imagine where you guys would be. So the, the, the you know, the, 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 the winners write the history books. So, these people that are in, in Paris and in Cuba and stuff, the people that are rising up, these aren't people who are like, oh, we're ready to be libertarians now. These are people who are like, we need someone powerful to come advocate for our position and fuck up all these people who are against us. That's the sentiment that they that they ultimately have. That's how every revolution ultimately, ultimately progresses. It's not the people ri- rising up and overthrowing the elites. It's the people saying, we don't want these elites anymore. We want these elites. We want a new set of elites to replace the old ones. So the, if, if you're wanting to go about this, a, a not you specifically, but in general, like the, 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 the king's you, um, if you want to go about this in a, the, the, the revolutionary, democratic, political sense, the best way to do that is to become the elites who will replace the other elites. And that's a like I fully understand how oh, impossible of a task that seems, and that's what I'm saying. That this 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 route of taking over the LP and all of this, this is something that you do if you've already got yourself in the position where you have massive wealth and power supporting your movement, where you have a uh, a, a a movement that is built around ideas that are extremely favorable or, or contribute to the prosperity and wealth and power of a segment of the elites. Those are the ideas that are going to win out ultimately. So um, it's not that I have a principled problem with the, the state as it is, or, or with the LP. It's not that I have a principled problem with engaging in politics this way. I'm saying that it's strategically not advisable. And then especially because of the ex- the existing state that we have and it's the nature um, in which it, 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 uh, it takes opposition to itself and uses that as a leveling up process. So, so the people who position themselves as the revolutionaries, the opponents of the state are ultimately going to be the facilitators of an even more tyrannical state. And they're going to be ground under the boots in the process. For sure. <clears throat> well, cool. That's a great place to wrap. Yeah. Nick said, you got to, get a bounce i do have the twins waking up too uh but yeah i mean could talk for i hours. appreciate this guys no yeah, this yeah, for sure we'll uh we'll have you back on next month for trump's inauguration <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> sounds <laughs> good <laughs> had to get this whole episode pulled from youtube at the last minute so <laughs> right <laughs> so well cool Matt. go ahead and give your plugs and uh yeah we'll talk to you again soon yeah um so you can follow me on twitter at real king pilled uh, on YouTube, uh, YouTube channel, just search for King Pilled, all one word, K-I-N-G-P-I-L-L-E-D. And then uh, Wealth, Power, and Influence with Jason Stapleton. Um, our episodes air live every, uh, or they, our episodes are posted every Monday, every Monday morning now. And we record the show live every Wednesday. We stream it to our private group. Um, it's a, a, a network that we created for um, entrepreneurs who are in the process of, of, uh, of building their own autonomy, basically creating their own freedom. Uh, through uh, the the creation of a digital business. We believe you've got to control the source of your income and you got to make that income mobile. And then you have to network yourself with communities of people who are like-minded. So um, if you're interested in that, you can uh, join the network at uh, mynomad.network. And yeah, that's it. Sounds good. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you, guys. All right, good. Yeah, my wife's texting me. She's like, Henry's got to pee. The twins are waking up. I need help. So (laughs) I know the feeling.